When the South African War broke out in 1899, the Boers hoped to use their temporary numerical superiority to inflict a decisive defeat on the British, as they had nearly 20 years earlier. But despite the initial setbacks and sieges of Mafeking and Ladysmith, this time the Unionist government in London held its nerve. Once it did so and committed to fighting the war to an end, chances of a Boer victory on the battlefield dwindled rapidly. The only real hope for Kruger from then on was that someone else would pull Boer chestnuts out of the fire, and that would require foreign intervention against the greatest empire on earth. Yet in 1899, when British blundering in the war appeared to reveal a weakness in the nation's much vaunted power, assistance from the European states did not seem like an impossibility. Throughout the continent, national newspapers delighted in mocking British defeats. For them, the war finally revealed London's self-righteous hypocrisy. But would the European governments themselves act? The Russians and French had a firm alliance and reasons enough to check British expansion, but alone they would lack the teeth to pose a serious threat. The joker in the pack was Germany. If Berlin, and more importantly, the Kaiser, could be convinced to partake in some sort of continental league, Austria, Spain and even Italy would have to be dragged along with it. In these circumstances, a united offer of mediation on behalf of the Boers, backed by the threat of joint intervention, would almost certainly have forced the British to accept. In October 1899, Muravyov, the Russian foreign minister, opened the bidding. The time had arrived, he announced to the Spanish premier whilst in Madrid, for the powers of Europe to take common action against the ever-increasing aggressions and expansion of England. There was, he continued, every prospect of an understanding between France, Russia and Germany to this end. He then moved on to Paris, engaging in secret conversations with his French opposite number, Del Casse. In a later dispatch, the foreign minister revealed that he had indeed agreed to bring the Boer War to an end with Russia when the opportunity arose. Paris and Petersburg's reasoning for such a policy towards Britain is clear and confusing. Both had reasons to dislike London. The Russians were at loggerheads with India over Persia, whilst France had only a year earlier been humiliated at Fashoda. Yet neither of these seemed to have been the foremost reasons for wanting to undertake this risky venture. Del Casse appears to have cared little about the legacy of Fashoda. He was more concerned that once Britain had finished with the Boers, it would finally be France's turn for the chopping block. And in regards to the rather vain Moraviov, Grenville is probably correct that his policy was more about pulling off some great diplomatic coup to cement his reputation than a genuine belief saving the Boers would somehow help Russia. With a policy built on as flimsy a foundation as this, the fact that the British Prime Minister Lord Salisbury never took the threat particularly seriously is hardly surprising. Yet, if the French and Russians could gain the assistance of Germany, this Continental League would suddenly become a lot more real. And initially, there was reason for hope. The German Kaiser, Wilhelm II, declared to the world his sympathy for the Boers in his famous Kruger telegram four years earlier, which had congratulated the Transvaal on resisting the Jameson raid, meant to overthrow its government. And in October 1899, he had loudly complained about British arrogance to the French ambassador in Berlin. Moraviev clearly thought there might be an opportunity and secured a meeting in early November, in it, he declared the Royal Navy was in as bad a state as the British Army, had the Kaiser literally laugh in his face for a response, and ended up leaving so dejected he did not even broach the topic of a continental league. Although Bulow, the German Chancellor, does seem to have privately mused about some sort of agreement with France and Russia, his ideas were firmly nixed by the Kaiser. Whatever his reasoning, there can be no doubt Moraviov's proposals never got off the ground in large part because of Wilhelm's goodwill towards Britain. But what was the reasoning for this goodwill? As ever, the Kaiser expected a reward for such good behaviour, and in the Samoan Islands he had already chosen his prize. The details of this dispute between Germany, Britain and the United States over the far-flung Pacific outpost are not particularly important. Wilhelm had set his heart on acquiring the principal island of Upolu as a naval coaling station, but Salisbury disliked being hurried into an arrangement, believing it was akin to blackmail given the circumstances. He adopted a classic Whitehall tactic of delaying responses on the issue for as long as possible, but this served only to wind the Kaiser up further. 
In a long letter to his grandmother, Queen Victoria, he poured out his complaints about Salisbury, signing it with, Goodbye, most beloved grandmama. With much love and respect, believe me, ever your most dutiful and devoted grandson. Grandmama was not amused. Your letter, I must say, has greatly astonished me. I doubt whether any sovereign ever wrote in such terms to another sovereign, and that sovereign is his own grandmother, about their prime minister. I never should do such a thing. Believe me, always your affectionate grandmother. For Salisbury's part, he seems to have been rather less perturbed by the Kaiser's animosity. I am rather puzzled at the German Emperor's observations to Grierson that I was his enemy, he wrote to a colleague. I cannot make out what I have done to deserve that distinguished reputation. It is a great nuisance that one of the main factors in the European calculation should be so ultra-human. He is as jealous as a woman because he does not think the Queen pays him enough attention. Salisbury finally gave way on the Samoan issue only when pressured by the cabinet. Wilhelm considered it a great victory and was genuinely delighted to receive an invitation to Windsor in the aftermath. There he was more English than the English, announced his love for the country and, as a special favour, sent a detailed plan to the Prince of Wales about how to win the South African War. That should then have been the end of proposals for a continental league. Unfortunately, another spanner was about to be thrown into the works. In the initial stages of the war, supplies continued to reach the otherwise surrounded Boers through Portuguese Mozambique. After the disasters of Black Week, the British looked to tighten a blockade of the territory. The first victims, with typical bad luck, turned out to be Germans. Over the course of a few days, three vessels were detained. They were finally released after a long delay in January 1900, but German public opinion was unsurprisingly incensed and Bülow took a hard line in the Reichstag, whilst the Kaiser grumbled to the Russian ambassador in Berlin. In this situation, Muravyov made a second attempt that March to secure some kind of agreement with Germany. The foreign minister himself seems to have gone cold on the idea by this point, for despite an earlier delight at British defeats, the new commander, Field Marshal Roberts, was now soundly beating the Boers. Muravyov's new proposal gave no suggestion of military action, only amicable pressure to end the war. But in response, Wilhelm wrote to the Prince of Wales, Yesterday I received a note from St. Petersburg, in which Count Muravyov invites me to take part in a collective action with France and Russia against England for the enforcing of peace and the help of the Boers. I have declined. This was an exaggeration of what the note actually said, but there can be no doubt that the Kaiser's intentions were genuine. Whatever the case, both the Queen and even the Prince of Wales, not a man overly fond of Wilhelm's charms, thanked the Kaiser. Salisbury remained unconvinced that there even was a proposed Continental League. In this, he was wrong. However, tentatively, Muravyov had proposed a league in March, and it had been the Kaiser that once more stopped it forming, even over the objections of Bülow, who once again appears to have contemplated some kind of agreement if France would drop its claim to Alsace-Lorraine. Salisbury was probably right to always look upon the possibility of a European League with extreme scepticism. Even if Wilhelm had proved susceptible, it would still very much have been a job of herding cats to try and make a continent of jealous and squabbling powers, put aside their differences and risk the wrath of the Royal Navy. Had such a thing happened, the British should fairly easily have been able to drive a wedge through the League, with, say, a concession in Persia here to Russia, and there in Morocco to France. Nonetheless, it is one of those intriguing moments in history that puts paid to any determinism about the ultimate antagonism between Germany and Britain. Relations would, of course, only decline from this high point, though Wilhelm's mix of romanticism, boyhood affection for his grandmother and preference for concessions in Samoa had combined to nix any alignment against London, the German public's feelings were evidently not the same, and the actions of the British in detaining German ships would partly spur on the construction of the High Seas Fleet, the navy that was to sow poison relations until 1914. Yet, at the turn of the century, for just a moment, the Kaiser could claim to be the saviour of Britain.